this opportunity to recognize and thank Kent, Kent Clendera at the UNAIDS, through whom we were able to reach around the world for our conference speakers to invite three LGBTQ plus community members from Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. Due to the time differences, in some cases as much as 15 hours between us here in New York City and the Pacific Islands, our speakers shared videos and they, they are likely joining us as well. We are honored to invite Joey Jolene Mataele from the Kingdom of Tonga in the Pacific, Liao Yangfa from Singapore, and Midnight Punkase Guatana from Bangkok in Thailand. Are they here? Hi, we're here. Ah, there you are! <laughs> yes, we're all Hello. here. Hello from tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, yes. Hello from tomorrow. Oh, my God. You guys are here. Who's here? Yes. Who's here? All of so us Joey, are here. Joey is here hey. as well. Oh, my God. This is midnight. Oh, my God. I've, I've spoken Hi. to you. Now I see you. Oh, Joey, Joey. Welcome. Hi. This is Yang Fa from Good morning. Singapore. From... Yes. Um, good morning. Is, good Richard, morning. is Richard there? Can he start playing your videos? Can you fast forward a little bit, Richard, to the videos, the Pacific Island and, and Southeast Asia videos? We've already gone through that already. Distinct core issue. Maloy Lele, my name is Joey Jolene Mataile from the Kingdom of Tonga. LGBT plus is the core issue here. LGBT plus is a socially constructed phenomenon. LGBT plus is one of the institutions in every society. LGBT plus have distinctive qualities of its own. LGBT plus have many positive contributions at all levels of society. Climate change and its impact have both negative and positive impacts on all people in society. But how much climate change have affected the LGBT community? When Cyclone Gita hit Tonga, we had such a hard time trying to rebuild our Tonga Latest Association office and living quarters. So especially housing our members that were not accepted in the evacuation centers, as most of those centers were uh, belonged to um, churches. So we had to divide some of our members um, in some of our homes because our living quarters were all gone. And when this pandemic COVID-19 happened, again, Majority of our members lost their jobs because majority of them works for hospitality indus industries and private companies such as hairdressers, hotels, cafes, restaurants. And again, this was a struggle for us to be able to cater for their essential needs to all their homes, as most of them were the bread and butter for their families as they were the ones that were working and they were the ones that were supplying. I, for one, have been stuck here in Australia for the past six months. As I was in the Solomon Islands dealing with a, a gay murder, also the Pacific campaign of the Ladies in Waiting movie. So when I went back, when I, on my way back to Australia, the Tongan borders and the New Zealand borders were closed. So I had to go into isolations for two weeks. But I thank God those two weeks I had families that I could rely on. Otherwise, I would have ended up on the street. The self-isolation experience is not a good experience. 
But what are the dominant perceptions of LGBT plus? Most perceptions of LGBT plus are mainly filled with negative constructions. These manifested in different forms of stigma and discriminations and oppressive behaviors that LGBT plus communities have received on a daily basis. Why are so many negative perceptions of LGBT plus continue to scale up in the context wherein human rights are strongly enforced? Why are so many negative perceptions of LGBT plus continue to scale up in the context of wherein, in, uh, wherein human rights are strongly enforced? Why are so many perceptions of LGBT plus continue to scale up in the context of Christianity? Why are so many negative perceptions of LGBT plus um, continue to scale up in the world wherein democracy is embraced? As our late King Tobo the Fourth say, always said, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. But which lack of knowledge ha that has led to our destruction? Specifically, know ourselves. If we don't know who we really are, our talent, our capabilities, the subsequent question will be, how can we control ourselves? How can we cope well with everyday stresses and challenges? And how we can, or how can we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? On the second golden rule, or the golden values of Tonga, love thy neighbor as love thyself. The second part of that golden rule, love thyself. If you do not love thyself, then how on earth are you going to be able to love your neighbor? These are reasons of love thyself. Know thyself, your talent, your capabilities. You have a deeper meaning and purpose for life, which goes beyond equitism. You have sufficient knowledge and skills of how to cope well with everyday stresses and challenges. As you can see, these are the good outcomes if we have a healthy mind. You do not look down upon yourself. You do not doubt yourself. You don't judge others. You work harder. You're not afraid to do anything, whether you may, regardless whether you make a mistake or not. You will love, respect, and support others without any agenda. And of course, you will achieve a happier life. So when people treat LGBT plus community differently or badly, that is because they are mentally unhealthy. In the context of color communities, LGBT plus community are treated in any, in, in, you have a deeper meaning and purpose for life, which goes beyond equitism. You have sufficient knowledge and skills of how to cope well with everyday stresses and challenges. As you can see, these are the good outcomes if we have a healthy mind. You do not look down upon yourself. You do not doubt yourself. You don't judge others. You work harder. You're not afraid to do anything, whether you may, regardless whether you make a mistake or not. You will love, respect, and support others without any agenda. And of course, you will achieve a happier life. So when people treat LGBT plus community differently or badly, that is because they are mentally unhealthy. 
In the context of colour communities, LGBT plus community are treated in any in an um, uncivil manner, and this clashes um, with Christianity belief. So, let me ask you: Is Christianity or religion your culture? Not that I hate religion. I love my religion. I love my faith. I love my Catholic Church. But please. Think again. The culture I have is love, love, and love. So if you have love in your heart and love thyself, you'll be able to love others. Malo Abito, thank you. What is it like to be different in Singapore? To be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer? Recently, a Singaporean man was fined $3,500 for posting on social media that he would like permission to open fire on the LGBTQ community in Singapore. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So when I went to high school, um, I got outed by a friend, uh, unintentionally, I guess, and so I got bullied a lot for it. But as a result, when I did a presentation one time, a lot of the kids in the back of the classroom would just start shouting, Hey, fag, stop it, you little pussy, you're like a princess. And yeah, that really pissed me off. So yeah, hate hurts. I'm a bisexual woman. I'm married to a man. Bis people often say that bisexuality is a face. Um, one friend even asked me whether I was into white meat now because I was married to a Caucasian man. Such comments really hurt. But sexuality is not just a face, it's a part of who I am. Hate hurts. And when my family found out that I was gay, I was actually kicked out of the house and I had to seek refuge with my friends and in camp. The feeling of being abandoned by my family, the people who think that I supported you the most, hurts. Hate hurts. I identify as a gay trans man. Two years ago, at my former workplace, I received complaints about my usage of the men's bathroom. A few weeks after I received the complaints, I was confronted by this particular person outside the bathroom and he started yelling at me saying that I had no right to use the men's bathroom at all and that he would call the police if he saw me using the men's bathroom again. At the time I felt very shocked and very scared because it was such an unexpected confrontation and I didn't know if he would actually call the police after that. Hate hurts. One time someone told my mother to shut up because she doesn't have a voice in the conversation because she has to handle her lesbian daughter first. This is the same woman who worked two jobs so I get to stay in university. And she tried her best not to tell me this incident because she didn't want to hurt my feelings. Hate hurts. I was walking down the street and uh, holding hands with my boyfriend at the time. And then this guy, who was obviously drunk, came up to us and he decided to grab my crotch. He did. It was really shocking. Hate hurts. Part of my job at Project X, I work with a lot of transgender women, especially transgender women in the sex industry. One of the stories that I've heard from the women that I've worked with is that of street harassment. Trans women tell me that a lot of teenage boys, or even slightly older boys, walk past them, shout vulgarities at them, use derogatory terms to describe them, and then run away laughing. Hate hurts. And I was 15 in school. Sawati Kap, greetings from Bangkok, Thailand, Thailand, to everyone. And suddenly there were a bunch of seniors who came up to me and they cornered me and they told me in my face that I should see a doctor because being gay was wrong. They knew that I was gay and they said that gays aren't accepted by society. It hurts. Homophobia, biphobia and transphobia are very real experiences for the LGBTQ community in Singapore. My name is Shini and I'm a counsellor with Uga Chaga and I see the effects of this every day. Uga Chaga is a community-based professional counselling and support service for LGBTQ individuals, couples and families. Hello everyone, my name is Liao Yang Fa. 
I'm the executive director of Ugi Chaga here in Singapore. I'm a registered social worker and my pronouns are he and him. Today I'd like to share with you a presentation and it's called The Environment and Me, A Queer Singaporean Perspective. So Ugi Chaga, we're Singapore's most established community-based professional non-profit organization and we work with LGBTQ plus individuals, couples and families and we've been doing that since 1999. I'd like to place you well geographically here in Singapore and um, well, that beautiful photo taken by Ping Dot. Um, in terms of land area, we are an island nation. So north south, we are 27 kilometers or 17 miles. East west, we are 50 kilometers or about 31 miles. And in terms of total population, it's about 5.7 million as at last year, June. And um, Total population includes resident population, citizens and permanent residents, as well as non-resident population, so employment pass holders, migrant workers, students of visas, and dependents and others. So as you can imagine, we are a pretty crowded island. In terms of our physical context, um, this is the Singapore economy. As at last year, um, at current market prices, our GDP last year was 507 billion Singapore dollars. That works out to be around 375 billion US dollars. In terms of per capita GDP at current prices, it's about 65,000 US dollars. And I believe that's comparable to the, um, uh, the US economy's uh, per capita GDP. And in terms of our mental health context, uh, specifically in terms of um, government expenditure, on healthcare, financial year 2017. We were a pretty rich country. We spent only 2.1% of our GDP on healthcare, of which only 11% is spent on mental health. And that works out to be only around 300 million Singapore dollars or 221 uh, million US dollars. Two years ago, uh, we published the key findings from the second mental health study and what it found was that there was an increase in lifetime prevalence of mental illness from 1 in 8 in 2010 to 1 in 7 in 2016. And what's striking is that there was no mention of the LGBTQ plus community in the mental health study. And this is because um, of um, well, a few reasons. And let's just invite you to consider our LGBTQ plus context here in Singapore. For the past 82 years, we've had criminalization, specifically through Section 377A of the Penal Code of the Republic of Singapore, which penalizes consensual same-sex intimacy between adult men in public and in private. And the term used in the legislation is gross indecency. And as you can imagine, this is lingering widespread impact on the LGBTQ plus community here in Singapore. Eight years ago in 2012, here at Ubechaga, we conducted a survey on homophobia and transphobia and biophobia, and we found that three in five of our respondents had experienced some form of discrimination uh, related to their sexual orientation and or gender identity. More than half had suicidal thoughts and or attempts, often as a result of experiencing some form of discrimination and there were also links to behavioral issues. In 2013, an independently conducted national LGBT census found that almost half, 44% of respondents were at risk of depression and compared to a separate study of the national population and their risk of uh, depression using very similar tools and questions. I think looking at those stats, I think it's probably fair to say that the um, LGBT community in Singapore is around four times at greater risk of depression compared to the national population. Um, a few months ago, earlier this year, a few months ago, uh, two local organizations, just want to acknowledge them, Brave Spaces and Sayoni, they jointly conducted a local survey of how COVID-19 had impacted LGBTQ plus persons here in Singapore. And from their survey, they found that quite remarkably, 
Remarkably, one in five respondents reported living in family environments that were hostile towards them, um, hostile towards uh, their sexual orientation and or gender identity. And three in five of respondents uh, reported facing challenges and having concerns about their mental health. Just to put the context for you, in Singapore, we had eight weeks of partial lockdown. We call it the circuit breaker in April and May. And this uh, study was conducted in May, if I'm not wrong, and results were released in June. So from our, um, from Ubi Chagas, kind of continuous 20 years of working with and supporting Singapore's LGBTQ plus community, we've learned a few things about uh, LGBTQ plus mental health and I've summarized this in this matrix. Um, I've titled it what we've learned and what we lack. Um, at three levels, at national level, we know that criminalization and the lack of legislation and protection play a big part in um, uh, that community's access to mental health. So of course, decriminalization and putting in place legislation and protection are crucial in enhancing access to mental health services. Um, and of course, the lack of currently, at least the lack of public awareness within the community and the lack of a very concerted effort to address stigma and discrimination within the LGBTQ community that also puts up barriers uh, to accessing mental health care. And of course, sadly, here in Singapore, we still have a situation where there are still people who um, refer, or young people, young LGBTQ persons to, to the attend convergent therapy. Uh, the word I prefer to use would be trauma, because as we know, um, such practices can induce and trigger trauma, certainly unethical professionally and harmful as well. At community level, uh, we, we, we know that there's a desperate need to invest in research and professional training in the areas of LGBTQ plus mental health and suicide. And right there, the acknowledgement that uh, minority stress, the experiences of minority stress play a very important part in uh, the mental health of the local LGBTQ plus community. That's uh, incredible work by Professor Ilan Meyer and others. And of course, the connection with the HIV prevention work, the very important HIV prevention work done by various organizations here in Singapore, and the need to continue addressing substance misuse that, as we know, has links to LGBTQ plus mental health as well. And at an individual level, we were very well aware of the various uh, barriers to mental health care. Uh, it will be examples will include uh, internalized shame, homophobia, transphobia, experiences of uh, um, uh, a link to a low self-esteem and peer pressure. All, all, all those are examples of uh, barriers to mental health care. And of course, the need to recognize the diversity of the healthcare needs in our diverse community, how different um, sub-communities um, experience uh, uh, um, uh, discrimination and uh, accessing health, mental health care services differently and acknowledging, of course, the impact of intersectionality as well. And of course, last but not least, and acknowledging that there's a, there's a link between uh, experiences and accessing mental health care services with sexual health care services and often from a service user's point of view, it makes sense to access both services together rather than separately. So I'll just leave this um, here for a while and then maybe we'll come back to this um, with more questions later on. Thank you. Uh, is that the, Richard, is that the end of all the videos? Um, Midnight, uh, Joy Jolene, and Liao, are uh, you guys there? There's one more video, Anton. Hold okay. on.
วัสดีครับ Greetings from Bangkok, Thailand to everyone attending the In My Mind Conference 2020, the Environment and Me. My name is Midnight. I am the Executive Director of APCOM, which is an Asia-Pacific network advocating on issues around HIV and those that advance the rights, health and well-being of people of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression and sex characteristics. And we have a diverse and passionate team working with the community, organizations in over 30 countries in Asia Pacific. So just to show you, this is our uh, current um, strategic framework called um, Tenacity. And um, in terms of our reach uh, of the region, so we cover these other countries that we cover in Asia Pacific. I'm so glad to be able to join you all here virtually in this gathering uh, where LGBT Q plus people of color discuss environmental issues impacting their mental health. I myself grew up in rural Northeast Thailand or what we call Isan. Yep. That's uh, just showing you a map. And I am, so this region is Isan, Northeast of Thailand. And I am from here near to Laos. Um, and this is the region where it's not very popular with tourists. So many people might not know about it, um, but it is very rural. Um, but I have been living and working in Bangkok for uh, 10 years now. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, people think it's vibrant and all that, but to live in, the, in Bangkok um, is certainly not the best place. Um, there's little green spaces, um, lots of pollutions and floods in rainy season. And of course, it's very crowded. So just to show you, this is the temple of the village in uh, where I grew up. So yeah, lots of spaces and yeah, not, not very um, kind of like blingy, let's say. Um, and the condo, the apartment that I'm living now, um, so this is in the on road area. Uh, 10 years ago, it was the age of Bangkok, but now it's really built up. I certainly don't feel like it's the um, age of Bangkok um, anymore. <laughs> and since the um, COVID-19 lockdown, my family has been living with me um, in the apartment, um, including my two sisters. Uh, my dad and uh, Pomeranian, um, and I think for mental health, uh, having a pet around um, has, has been very good for me and also my family. Um, now that Thailand is um, you know, doing rather well with COVID-19 control, we are able to kind of go out and most places are now open. You still have to do social distancing and people have been very good at wearing masks. Um, and I think that really helps break our day and it's been you know, much better for mental health than previous where we had uh, lockdowns and there was a restrictions in the movement. So I know that um, in many cases, um, in uh, many parts of the world, that is, not, um, that is not the case. I was very lucky to um, receive uh, a scholarship to study in the UK and coming from a rural background, I am acutely aware of the social inequity and that opportunities are not equal. I completed my master's in globalization and development um, from SOAS, the University of London. And um, as a gay guy, I feel very lucky to be working for APCOM where we can freely express ourselves and work on something that's meaningful and also contributing back to the community and making it a little bit more equal. As some of you may know, um, Thailand is a majority Buddhist country. We don't have issues around um, being LGBT, um, culturally, however, there are no supportive laws and policies either, and um, you know, in uh, society still uh, largely follows uh, societal norms. Transgender people don't have their gender recognized. Um, there's been positive movements around the same-sex um, civil partnership bill, so um, we might be a second place in um, Asia after Taiwan to have that. So fingers crossed. My main chat here, um, I would like to give my experience as an Asian gay guy working in an NGO. And, and as you know, we work across some um, diverse communities and liaise with um, development partners, UN agencies, donors, as well as governments. And then also talk a bit about um, how uh, I have been navigating through um, COVID-19 pandemic as a leader of an NGO. So as I said, um, I work at the international level and most times I deal with larger institutions um, and more often than not, um, I'll be talking to experts um, that is not from this region and they don't look like me. Um, but however, you know, they'll be heading um, a department with staff that, uh, you know, that, that look like me basically. Um, 
So when I have to deal a lot with, say, you know, white gay men who hate departments and are senior experts in big institutions and come with, you know, they say experience and expertise. And I feel like when we go to those spaces, we have to kind of listen to them. And, um, and I don't get the same kind of treatment as a community leader. I might, you know, be mistaken for hospitality staff or, um, or that I think my views don't matter or sometimes when I go to spaces like that, I get invited to kind of fit the quota for community engagement, but not really about um, understanding the real issues or want to action on some of the recommendations that I present. So I do get frustrated and it, um, it takes me more of an effort to, I suppose, uh, you know, approach someone, start a conversation so they can see that I am not um, uh, just a community person I come with experiences and can also engage on a meaningful level uh, and but most times then I think the people with power don't then approach right they just wait for someone to come and approach them or if they see someone white they can they probably think oh yeah I'll go and approach that person because they probably somewhat important um, this is so pervasive but it's almost normal I think in, 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 in our spaces where we do go to those meetings and I have found that then when I do disagree or when I don't conform to those norms, uh, meaning that, oh, you know, we have to listen and be respectful and, um, and, and agreeing um, and not to be um, confrontational. And then when I don't conform to that, um, I think they get very um, angry, I suppose, in terms of like, how dare this Asian person don't listen to me or going against me or don't, li don't listen to my views. And I have to say at times, um, it, it takes a lot of energy to kind of even stand up to talk openly and say, look, I don't, I don't agree with that. Or I think it should be the way. Um, and, uh, you know, to be seen, to be heard and to feel like you are valued. Um, it takes extra hard work to be taken seriously and um, to demonstrate that uh, I matter or people of color matter in those spaces and not just from, uh, you know, personal experiences only, but we actually want some actions. We want to change things. But when I do that, or when I do say write emails that disagree, I have felt um, at times that, oh, look, if I write this, if I say this, what if then the club will close, the door will close on me or my organization in terms of access to funding, in terms of access to opportunities, in terms of, um, uh, access to um, you know the right people, the right stakeholders that we need to speak to. So it's such it becomes such a dilemma, and I sometimes have to think that if I don't do right by what I think, it might be affecting my organization. Um, and and I think this is something that um, you know, uh, leaders within LGBT uh, experience that a lot. But we don't actually have the space to talk about this openly. And um, to give you another example, I remember going into an embassy function and there were a lot of diplomats. Uh, and there was this one um, Asian uh, diplomat from an Asian country. And he said he has to wear a badge um, of his uh, country to make sure other people don't mistake him for uh, office staff or, or hospitality staff. And that he is actually from the embassy and people would come and approach him to talk to him about issues uh, and not see him as a star. I mean, we did laugh about it um, and, and we did share experiences about how I also feel like, you know, in, in the NGO sector, I actually feel like that is the case. But even at diplomatic levels, um, uh, people of, uh, you know, Asian descent also feel like that. So it must be really widespread. And secondly, I think as the head of uh, an organization, members of my team do view me as the backbone um, to kind of lead the organization. And I have to say, I question my leadership sometimes because, you know, you're supposed to kind of be able to go through the crisis, whatever hits, you're supposed to be the kind of rock. But I think COVID-19, it just demonstrated that um, whatever we think um, leaders um, are or have to be, that is really not the case. We don't have um, the tools to be dealing with the realities that is hitting us right now. But I was astonished that our team were more resilient than I thought, um, and they were able to pivot quickly and come up with great ideas and make decisions and take actions and follow through. So instead of me feeling like I'm alone to do this leadership, um, you know, and allowing that um, we have a small team of uh, 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 management, 
um, they, could, or they could also lead and they feel like uh, they are able to and comfortable to lead and that I need to support them to be able to lead through their um, initiatives. So this process itself has um, changed the way that we function as an organization, actually. Uh, so some of the things, for example, that um, the management team has come up with in terms of um, navigating through the pandemic is the AppCom COVID-19 protocol, shifting the way that we're working so that we operate um, to the needs of the community and supporting the communities on the ground. And then we set up the emergency funding through the campaigns called Corona App Compassion. So up until now, we've supported 12 organizations in Asia Pacific region on emergencies. And these are basically done by the staff themselves um, from their um, salary donations. Uh, we have been able to do the special newsletter COVID-19 series since the 3rd of April. So up until now, we are on our 15th issues, you know, um, and the newsletter series looks at um, how the communities are, are navigating the challenges that they have from the sub-regions or from different communities, uh, from different professions. And uh, we are able to kind of make sure there is still that voice uh, for the communities in Asia Pacific region to then have an outlet to talk about things from their own perspective. We used to have um, daily staff Zoom check-in uh, when there was a lockdown. And that um, helped us really with, uh, with the mental issues. It was very strange because it was, we opened up a lot more on Zoom uh, check-ins than we were uh, in a room together physically. So that was, um, so that we, we keep it on doing that, but now it's more uh, weekly um, Zoom check-ins. We've had um, staff trainings online and even had the training um, on um, mental health. And we have now institutionalized a monthly mental health team kind of like sessions. So we went to uh, baking together and we last week went to uh, a gay sauna to make um, spa products. <laughs> uh, we also communic uh, coordinating with the kind of like the community, uh, LGBT and HIV communities on the effects of COVID-19, um, helping them to apply for uh, emergency funding. So, um, because we, at the regional level, we know what funding is available so we can help the small organizations to apply for those funding. So what has come out from this experience for me is that um, we are creating opportunities for people of color, you know, to be lifted, to have an opportunity, to have a chance, to try and get experiences, skills, knowledge, and know-how, and the network that supports each other. Most times, I think, um, the environment makes us see each other as opponents or rivals for funding. And, in the, and then that doesn't support us, the movement, whatsoever. So at Upcom, we try to recruit people from the region, that um, might not have the experience of working at the regional level or might not be so connected to some of the movements already that are more established, but then lead, getting them in and helping them go through the process and learn um, from doing the work, uh, which can be very daunting. Um, but I think if, it's, if we're helping someone through that process, uh, they will feel more comfortable and confident. Professional side, we have seen that sharing our weaknesses has been um, and continues to be a challenge. Even though I said that we had a good you know, Zoom session to talk about mental health, uh, for many um, countries in this region, you know, talking about your mental health is very much taboo. And our default is to kind of say, we, are, you know, we, we can do the work, we can do the work better, and we can deliver to our best abilities and really ignoring our mental health needs. But um, I think as more and more of us share our concerns and experiences and insecurities, it does allow others to also share the experiences as well. Um, this is something that, you know, I think it has to be a learned process. Uh, it's something that I hope to do more of um, in the future. And, in, and I think this session itself, you know, has been uh, really um, outside my comfort zone, let's say. Uh, so I really thank you for the opportunities and, you know, for um, In My Mind Conference 2020 for the invitation, for me to share my experiences. And thank you to you all for tuning in for the session. Swadi Kap. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I am so glad that we have you guys here in person. Um, somebody just commented to me that we might be losing people because they don't want to see pre-recorded. So I'm really glad that you're here in live in flesh and in person. Um, Joy Jolene, I am so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming on. 
And I know it's like really early on, th on Friday morning for you. So I hope when this is done, you are able to get a chance to get some sleep. Um, and, and same thing with you, um, Liao and Midnight. Um, so I'm listening to your videos and a couple of things that come out at me is that you're all sharing issues that people here in the United States are experiencing as well. So it says across the board, everyone is experiencing the same issue. Okay? Basically, basically the same issues. But what I'm interested in is from each of your respective positions, where you're located, how is the physical climate? So Midnight talked about Bangkok being lots of people and pollution. Uh, Yangpa, you may have some of that in Singapore. In, in Singapore. Uh, Joy Jolene, I know that there may be some degree of you know, pristine beaches still remaining and, and so forth. And, but then you also have the, the impact of cyclones and stuff that keeps ripping through your, you know, the, the islands. So you've got the physical external aspect of it, but you're representing and talking about internal things that are taking place in the society, in the culture. And how in each of your respective environments do you see that these two things come together that impact your mental, your specific mental health, as well as people in your respective communities, and then impact the way, the choices and the decisions that you make and that you may have to live with? Are you guys, are you guys got my, my question? It's a pretty yep. long, convoluted question. It is. It's several questions. In fact, I'm going to try to answer some. I'm going to try to answer some bits of it and then maybe Joey Midnight can, can jump in and answer other parts yeah, of it. I mean, and it's, it, yeah. it wasn't in terms of question for one person. Yeah. Okay, it's a multi layered question, but it's capturing all of your experiences. Yeah. And I want to really recognize and honor you being here with us today, uh, being part of this conference. All right, but, so you want to jump in? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go first because it's easier to go first and then we can divide the, the rest up. Um, again, coming from Singapore, we're so, I mean, the issue we talk about the physical environment, we're so densely populated, the urban built environment, so high population density. And as we all know, that always has an impact on mental health. Um, yeah. I mean, just, just a couple of examples, something I've noticed now that things are slowly picking up, we're, we're easing out of our lockdown measures. Uh, the COVID situation is improving here in Singapore. We're getting back on the streets. And something I've noticed living and growing up in Singapore is we have stopped saying hello. You go into a shop, the, the shop assistants just kind of go, yes. That's how they might greet you in a shop, yes. As in, yes, what do you want? Yes, you want to pay. It's not even yes, can I help you, it's yes. So the hello, and I've also noticed I have these conversations with friends, with um, family. Um, the, the sense of common courtesy seems to be slowly eroding away. So the hellos and the thank yous and the excuse me's are slowly disappearing from our urban Singaporean vocabulary. So that's an observation. I'm, I'm wondering if it's a function of a population density. Yeah, and uh, that certainly has an impact on mental health. You know, you bump into somebody. <laughs> oh, it happens in New York City as well, does it? Okay, yeah, what's happening here? Yeah, yeah. I, I know it happens in Hong Kong as well, again, another densely populated city. I don't know, does it happen in Bangkok at night? I don't think it does. Yeah, I, it does, okay, yeah. Joy Jolene, you want to jump in? Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, um, I, I think one of the things that... Um, that we're, we're still so bulked up in, in, in Tonga is really uh, the country has, you know, adopted that, um, the new, new culture of um, religion, you know, and um, when it comes to, to um, cyclones and, and disaster, natural disasters in, 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 the, in the island, um, well, 
every day we are always thinking of, you know, that the UN, they kept saying that Tonga is going to be sinking soon, you know, because of global warming and, you know, climate change and all that. Um, but um, when it comes to disaster, one thing that we notice is throughout the whole time of, of times that where there was no disaster, everybody's using, they, they, they love the, the trans people being around, they accept them for, for the, the ability to do things, you know, and uh, to help the families and all that. But when it comes to actually making this decision for each person, it's totally different. It's a totally different um, mentality altogether. And when it, you know, and um, you're not, it's either they use religion as something to bombard us with, or they totally forget that there was a culture before Christianity came into you know, to our islands. And um, then that friendly island um, personality just totally disappear. And it does, the, the impact of, of, of that negativity um, is being used in when it comes to disaster. When we, uh, uh, when there's food distribution from the government or the, I don't know whether it was it's the actual government who gives away that decision to not to bring anything to our center or the persons or the people that are distributing the goods from that are given away to, to the community are, uh, are the ones that are, they don't recognize our center, you know, they or bring any, any help at all. Or when they go, uh, when our, um, um, when our uh, members go to all the uh, uh, evacuation centers, they, you know, they'll accept their families, but they won't accept a trans person because the, to them, it's the risk for them to, you know, to come into that center, to the evacuation center. So it, it really, um, it, it's a problem because, it becomes our problem, the ones that are working, uh, you know, at the, at, this, at the drop in center. And we don't have the capacity to actually feed everyone, then to look after everyone, you know. And not only that, in, in, in our, um, in our uh, little association, we only have, we only could afford one paid staff, you know, and we had to fundraise throughout the year to actually be able to operate the office, the volunteers, the living, uh, the people that are living at the, at the uh, living quarters of our, of our center, which we can only uh, um, uh, be able to house at least 12 people, you know, and, and that, I, I think, with the new evangelism um, uh, churches that comes into our country, those are the ones that we're having problems with. And I'm sorry to say, but these are uh, uh, evangelists that actually come from, um, <clears throat> you know, from uh, that are paid by the U.S. of A. You know. And they're funded by TBN from the United States of America. So, uh, I, and they're the biggest barrier for us. And they're the ones that are actually broadcasting things on TV and all that. And it actually takes away the mind of people, you know, from where the, the real tongue and hospitality and, you know, the friendly islands are known for. Um, I think that's all I want. Yeah, I think I think, and that's that's uh, another form of American uh, colonialism, and American neo-imperialism, because I think the evangelical churches here in the United States have recognized that they have lost the same-sex battle when the Supreme Court. But even before that, they saw that there was a gradual shift towards greater acceptance for same-sex relationships in the United States, even though. Homophobia still exists, even though <clears throat> still exists, it's still perpetuated. 
but the evangelicals felt that let's go to where there are people who depend on our money. And so you find that Africa, and I know Brian is on here, and Brian may actually be able to talk about this in, uh, you know, a little bit, that they are going to Africa, for example, and to even to the Pacific and Southeast Asia, and even South America and the Caribbean, and evangelizing and under the name of God and spreading a lot of hate, which is then capitalizing on a small percentage or a small portion of the people's mentality that then turns them against everyone. And one of the things that I was trying to listen to you say, Joey, is I was wondering if for a minute you were going to say that because of these evangelicals and the churches in the island, that when the cyclones come, that the transgender community get blamed, that the LGBT community get blamed for it, saying that it's a curse from God rather than a natural occurrence. You don't have to answer that, but, but because that is something that also goes back in history, that that was what was used to, um, to demonstrate for people with mental health issues, that they were demon possessed, that they were cursed by God. And so when natural disasters happen, it is that person's fault because that person is cursed by God. Um, and one of the things that I did like that, um, that Midnight was talking about just now is when he, and then I think Liao echoed it in, 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 in the chat, is when he talked about, when Midnight said that very often he has, when he stands up and he tries to speak for himself or tries to speak for his community, he is seen as confrontational or a conflict um, instigator against the white establishment. But trust me, it's the same, it's the same thing here. It's the same thing here. And earlier this morning, I raised some of those questions with a couple of people that um, were, were, were previous speakers. And I know that what I raised with them is going to rattle all sorts of cages at the state level. Uh, Midnight, do you want to jump in here on this for a quick comment? Uh, no, I think it's great to, because uh, I saw on, on a chat as well that this is also shared and I think we don't have the spaces to share this kind of like sometimes very internalized. I know I feel like, uh, you know, maybe that is it just me, you know, who's actually feeling that. And then I think once you start sharing, then you realize actually it's not just you, it's actually very um, structural, institutional, and it's, um, and it's really prevalent, right, in, in a way that you think, gosh, Okay, then how do um how do we then um challenge it in a way that then doesn't um uh make uh, uh I guess I think the way the, the way that we that we have to challenge it, it cannot it, it has to be a movement right rather than just one person or one institution or an NGO sector that it has to we have to build that um understanding together um with the community because I think the structure itself makes the community splintered. <laughs> Um, and so we, we, so we don't share information like this, you know, we don't share information about, okay, this donor is giving us money, how do they deal with that with you? Um, uh, you know, how are they uh, asking you for information? Are they doing the same thing? How much are they giving to you? But, you know, in the, in the donor environment, these are the things that they share about the communities, right? And, and why is it different? So I think it's, that, that for me, um, that's what I'll, I'm trying to do in terms of building that sense of community. And I already talked to um, young Fanjolene about okay, how do we get this community to talk, uh, like particularly younger, newer organizations and leaders to talk to us as like someone who's been in the system for a bit and have a frank talk about issues that they're also facing. But, but, uh, but, the, but there's, there are two things about what you're saying there, uh, Midnight, that I find extremely powerful and I'm not thinking for one minute that what you're experiencing is different because we experience the same thing here. And I'm just seeing that somebody saying that they experience the same thing in Canada. And I think, and I think it's what I like about what we are doing now is that we are able to reach across the world because for many years, the United States has often seen itself as the only place on the face of the earth where life exists. And because it's part of the American educational system as a center of the universe, and everybody else outside of it are savages. But I think our global community now tells us 
that we are all, we share a lot of common experiences. One other thing that I think I'm hearing from you too is that we also have the issue here with funders, but it is the questions that they ask and it's the material, it's the, it's the, it's the information they're seeking. What are, they, what are they doing with this information when they collect it? And it's how they're asking the questions. Even the questions that they're asking in their funding requests are racist because it's often white people who sit down with some black enablers and they just do that. They come up with all these, these policies and these rules and regulations and this is how we must ask the question. And I think one of the things that I've been doing here is pushing back against that. And I've been saying to people, if you want people to be asking questions, who are the people that are preparing the questions to ask? And are those questions being reviewed by people in the communities to whom you're asking those questions to ensure that there is appropriate representation? Does, does, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, can I jump in, uh, Anton? Yeah. yeah. And just uh, to go back to what uh, you actually said earlier, um, you know, being blamed. Um, we, oh, believe me, we have been blamed for so many things. It started from HIV, you know, when, when AIDS started in Tonga in 1987, we, weren't, we were blamed for that. Um, and when um, uh, an, another, when Cyclone Gita happened, they actually blamed homosexuality for that. And when pandemic, when the pandemic happened um, in, you know, the uh, uh, COVID, the first ever person that was is in, uh, infected was a gay guy from Fiji, who was actually a worker on Air Pacific, on Fiji Airways. And he got infected from someone who uh, he was diagnosed from uh, um, in Fiji, and he had uh, COVID. And he was the first Pacific guy who actually got. Um, and the social media went berserk, and they were, you know, even the the, the, the Tongans that live overseas and all that, they all saw that posting. And they blamed, they turned around and said, see, it's a homosexuality, it's the hom this is the reason why the, this pandemic is because of homosexuality, and it went on and on and on, you know. But did that, you know, stop us from what we were doing? No, it didn't, it, you know. Um, we turned, it's like we actually turned a blind eye about it, and we couldn't, be, the reason why we didn't fight back is because to us, it's a, you know, it's a waste of time, you know, and um, and it does it won't feed us if we if we fight back. And when you when you're actually talking about you know um, uh, funders, you know, it, it's this is something that we are always having trouble with. You know, the language that the funders use is a language that we, from the community, from a small community, uh, rural area community, don't speak of, you know? And they, and, and uh, sometimes they, um, we, we have to do other things to get the, to achieve the goal or the, or what the funders want, because, you know, and, and we're always having a lot of problems back at home. You know, um, when we deal with funders, we, we, you know, and 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 because we we don't speak the same language, you know, we always have a hard time trying to get funding for our, our you know, because we the we and what I they call me always call me the bitch from my you know uh, from from Tonga because I tell the funders if you do not come to Tonga and see the, how things are done over there, then forget about your money because we don't need it. You know, you might think I can just take your money now and I'll go to Dubai and spend it over there and I'll come back and write a report to you, a bullshit report and, t and tell you, oh, I, we did this and that. No, in order for us to do what you want, you need to come to Tonga and see how things are done in our country to get your results that you want. 
and and when it comes and especially when it comes to surveys you know i hate it when someone just turned around and said oh we need a we need tonga to do this survey to you know it's about lgbt blah 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 you open that survey and you come across things that don't we don't, doesn't even exist in our in our country you know in our community that the western countries go through you know and how are we are we to actually answer things like that you know questions like that so what we we usually do like the hiv surveys and multi country surveys and all that we ask the ones that are making the survey to bring the survey for us to translate it we spend time even though we don't have the resources to do the translations but we would rather go through that language to translate it to what we're used to so our people our uneducated community members understand what that survey is all about and what the funder wants you know so i i just wanted to um to sh to share that um the experience that we go through you know uh, with funders and god knows what else thank you very much joy jolene it's such a pleasure to finally see you even though maybe hopefully one day as i am not muslim but i will say inshallah maybe in one day i shall come to, to visit you in tonga uh, midnight please do <laughs> midnight well i i'm coming for the beach okay that's all i'm coming for the beach and okay the okay <laughs> midnight <laughs> thank you very much for helping to coordinate this oh, i am pleasure. so grateful to you you have no idea and I know that you guys are, and I know that you guys want to go sleep. I know that you're tired. You might have had a long day on Thursday yesterday. So thank you very much. And I do look forward to speaking some more with you, Liao and Joey, because I had mentioned to you, um, midnight, uh, another, another conversation. Okay. You remember? Yes. And I, I am also very appreciative of the fact that you took time from your own conference planning to spare me this time. Okay? Mm -hmm. I am very grateful. Liao, yes. I look forward to talking with you again. I look forward to being in touch with you some more. There is so much commonality in what we are talking about that I, there is, I, can't, I, I don't know where to, I mean, we could stay here for the rest of the day. Okay? But you've got to get to sleep, and I got Brian <laughs> waiting in the wings to come on, and I got breakup, so there's a whole lot. So, let's let's make it a let's make an appointment that we will pick this up and continue this conversation because joy jolene said something was talking about something just now which i which was echoing about what fun, what funders are asking for what funders want from us okay and we have the same issue here they see the black community or black and people of color community as something to be researched let's get numbers on them so we can get the money but then the money does not come to the black and people of color communities we are just counted so i know exactly what you're talking about so once again thank you guys very much for sharing your time and effort with us um brian where are you lots of love from tomorrow <laughs> have a great yeah. conference good night everyone <laughs> bye <laughs> So this <laughs> Thank is now you the very much. Call from tomorrow to us yesterday. Oh, this is so nice. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joy Jolene. And thank you, Midnight. And thank you, Leo. Go sleep now. <laughs>